At the end of the 19th century, interurban railway companies were rapidly appearing worldwide. Some were short lines and just as short-lived. Others were grand networks within cities and formed into large urban commuter systems. For those hundreds of companies somewhere in between, the story of investment, growth, decline, and closure is often quite similar, and often is found ending with the railway giving way to the automobile and bus, or the electrical industry. Among these lines can be found an inner urban company in central Maryland which seems to stand out in the minds and imagination of many as being unique. Despite its story being similar to so many others, interest in the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway can be found all across the nation. Maybe it is the fact that such an unlikely line survived six decades, or the wide variety of equipment which operated in rural communities, or perhaps it could be the scenic views that the line offered to passengers and rail fans alike, which had drawn so many to visit and photograph trolleys here in the last years of operation. The system is fondly remembered by many, even those who never had the opportunity to see the heart of Maryland route in operation. Its story is that of interurban trolleys in America, and yet its history and operations were somehow uniquely H&F. That is why the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Historical Society strives to preserve and educate the public about this valuable piece of area history. The story of the H&F begins in Middletown, Maryland, once a major stopping point and growing community along the Baltimore National Pike, which was part of Thomas Jefferson's National Road. The town's economy suffered from the advent of the early railroads traveling between western points and the cities of Washington, Baltimore, and Philadelphia, which had once relied on the road. Already poor maintenance along the road grew worse as the companies which maintained it faltered, and residents were left to try and keep the once Macadam Road passable. The farmers in the Middletown Valley, divided from many larger communities and railroads by Catoctin and South Mountains, struggled to ship goods to and from markets effectively, often taking large teams, light loads, and an entire day to travel the nine miles to the city of Frederick due to a road which was, at most times, ruddy or deep mud. In 1854, the residents of Middletown found hope in a proposed railroad line, but the idea was quickly abandoned by its big city promoters. Several other proposals to construct a steam railroad to the valley were never successful in gaining capital. It was not until after Frank Sprague demonstrated in Richmond that his electric trolley car could climb steep slopes that a truly viable railway was envisioned. With little support from the residents of the city of Frederick or any outside investors, the Frederick and Middletown Railway Company, headed by Frederick area farmer George William Smith and funded by Valley residents, constructed and opened the Nine Mile Route in 1896. Enthusiastic residents rode the mountain climbing electric cars in droves, at times exceeding the safe rider capacity despite the steep grades. And farmers were so quick to make use of the comparatively rapid freight services that the company was forced to increase its small fleet of freight cars within the first year of operation. That same year, two men from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, William Jennings and Christian Lynch, saw opportunity in the city of Hagerstown for a worthwhile investment in transportation. Hagerstown city residents were more supportive of the proposal of a trolley system than those in Frederick had been. And by the time Frederick and Middletown were connected, much of Hagerstown and the nearby community of Williamsport along the Potomac River and CNO Canal could already be reached by electric trolley. As time passed, both companies expanded their routes and by 1904 had connected to one another. Travelers, who at one time may have needed to stop overnight in Middletown or Boonesboro along the 27 mile trek between the two cities by road, could now travel from Frederick to Hagerstown in about two hours. The following year, the Frederick County trolleys came under the control of a Middletown businessman named Emery Koblenz. Koblenz had grand ideas and quickly grew the company, wrapping various subsidiaries into a new name, the Frederick Railroad Company. Soon after, the company absorbed a steam railroad that had been intended to connect Georgetown with Gettysburg, yet had only completed the 17-mile route from Frederick to Thurmont. This gave the Frederick Railroad a direct freight and passenger link with the Western Maryland Railway main line in Thurmont. From 1910 to 1912, the company initiated drastic infrastructure improvements and purchased newer and stronger equipment for both passenger and freight service. Among these improvements, trolley wire was added above the route to Thurmont. A new terminal was built for passenger and freight in the heart of Frederick, and a brand new brick car barn was built alongside the company's freight yard just outside of the downtown area. Once the railroad was in its ideal shape, Koblenz then set his sight on the true prize, electricity. 
Needing more power to increase rail service and continue to add electric customers along the line, Koblenz began a joint company in partnership with the Hagerstown Railway in order to construct a power plant for both trolley systems at a community known as Security along the Western Maryland line just outside of Hagerstown. By the time the plant was finished in 1913, the two companies had agreed to merge into the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Company. Little modernization of the rail system would ever take place after that time. Additional trolleys were built and replaced over the years, but all similar to those the company had been using for decades, and after 1921, the company would never again purchase a brand new car. Instead, they purchased entire companies, expanding the electrical network to new communities and adding more power plants along the way. In the 1920s, other streetcar services services, including the Chambersburg, Greencastle, and Waynesboro Street Railway, which the H&F had exchanged passengers with at Shady Grove, Pennsylvania for years, as well as the Cumberland Street Railway, became a part of this network. Despite 3.8 million passengers in 1920, the expansion of the electrical utility end of the business proved Koblenz's vision a worthwhile investment, providing over two-thirds of the company's income for that year. The focus on energy was paying off, and the company decided to rename itself to reflect this, becoming the Potomac Public Service Company in 1922, a name that lasted only one year before being changed once more to the Potomac Edison Company. Now operating as a PE subsidiary, the Hagerstown and Frederick cars continued to travel the countryside despite a steady decline in ridership. Line closures began on the city routes in 1927 and 1929 as the company began to purchase several bus companies. Hagerstown City had its own dedicated bus service under the Potomac Edison umbrella, while the company began a brand new business known as the Blue Ridge Bus Company, which offered long-distance travel between towns and cities. Blue Ridge would compete with local trolley services and national rail lines alike before becoming the eastern framework for Greyhound's expansion in the 1950s. In 1938, the line from Funkstown to Myersville was closed and removed with the encouragement of the state of Maryland. The state wanted to build a new highway along what had been the trolley route over South Mountain. This would be the new Route 40 bypass, which would have crossed the railway at seven locations in Washington County. World War II boosted ridership in the years following, and the U.S. Army made use of H&F services with an already existing connection to Fort Detrick and a new Army salvage yard on Jefferson Street. During the war, many residents recall burned and battered tanks and planes within train cars of scrap metal being pulled through Frederick by the trolleys. After the war had passed, the post-war automobile explosion and the lifting of gas rations caused a sharp decline in trolley ridership, as well as the creation of one-way streets in both cities. Frederick trolleys simply changed their terminus to avoid these roads, but the same could not be done in Hagerstown. Unable to continue trolley service to Washington Street, the company decided to inaugurate a new bus route on August 4th instead. They sent all three of Washington County's trolleys on one final trip with great fanfare and returned the passengers on the buses. In the final years of service, the Hagerstown and Frederick name was dropped entirely, simply becoming Potomac Edison's Railway Division. In those last decades of operation, very little differed on the H&F compared to 1915, aside from the fact that only two inner urbans remained in service. Rail enthusiast groups from all over the country came to visit and write a piece of American history. Groups including the Electric Railroaders Association and the National Railway Historical Society's chapters sometimes chartered special trips along the line, allowing for photo opportunities at the many unique and scenic locations along the route. It was from this early interest in preserving the memory of the H&F that collectors began to also gather and preserve souvenirs and documents from the company. In 1954, Potomac Edison received approval to abandon passenger service from Frederick to Thurmont. Small crowds gathered in towns along the line on a dreary February 20th to watch the last two trolleys pass by. The official last car was number 172, which had also been the last on the main line, the last in Hagerstown, and the last from Middletown. It now would be remembered as the last inner urban to keep a schedule east of Chicago. Speeches and memories were presented to celebrate 58 years of trolleys in Frederick County. At Hood College, where many students arrived to school by trolley for decades. Several gathered during the return trip and presented flowers and songs to company president R. Paul Smith. That same morning, bus service to replace the 17-mile trolley trip began. However, even the bus was canceled in 1955. During 1955, the overhead wires were removed and two Whitcomb diesels replaced the electric freight motors. With improved highways and modern trucks, the need for freight exchange at Thurmont virtually disappeared and the line was abandoned and removed in 
in sections as customers along the route switched to road vehicles. In 1961, most of what remained were customers near existing railroads in Frederick, and so Potomac Edison sold off its remaining railroad assets. The bus service had already been sold in the years prior, leaving Potomac Edison as solely a utility company. Several pieces of H&F rolling stock found second lives for many decades, often serving longer as sheds and cabins than they had served in active rail service. Line car number 15 and safety coach number 48 were even kept together as a chapel and rectory for a time. Today, however, only four original Hagerstown and Frederick car bodies are known to still exist. The shell of number 171, which was built by Brill in 1919 and served as the other last trolley to Thurmond in 1954, still remains a private cabin. Many hope that this car will someday be saved and placed on public display. Sister Interurban number 168, which was the first of the H&F signature style steel-bodied cars, also built by Brill in 1917, was used as a cabin along the Potomac River. It was donated to a model railroad club which once met at the Hagerstown Fairground, remained there for many years before being relocated and is now displayed at the Hagerstown Roundhouse Museum, where the museum hopes to someday give the car a cosmetic restoration. Coach number 150, purchased secondhand in 1924, was rescued from an abandoned cabin in 1993 by Don Easterday and became the centerpiece of the Myersville Trolley Festival for nearly two decades. It is now owned by the town of Myersville, which has cosmetically renovated the car, brought it up to building codes to be opened as a static display and reading area inside the town's new public library. And finally, Freight Motor Number no. 5, which was built in the Frederick Shops in 1920, spent several years as a garden shed before being moved to the Rock Hill Trolley Museum, where it remained in storage for many years. In the early 2000s, it was donated to the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Historical Society and transported to Thurmont, before then being donated to that town. The town of Thurmont proudly displays the car along Main Street, on the site where the H&F Thurmont Station once stood. Several structures and landmarks also remain of the H&F across the system. Both brick car barns survive, as does the Frederick Terminal, which is currently planned to be the centerpiece of a proposed hotel complex for downtown Frederick. H&F stations still stand in Myersville, Boonesboro, Braddock Heights, and Jefferson, although each has been repurposed over the years. A keen eye can find parts of the route in many areas passing through towns and farmland, and even on South Mountain, where the line was abandoned in 1938, some locations of the track bed across the landscape are still evident. Until recently, Potomac Edison maintained an archive of its history, including a wide assortment of documents, maps, and photographs of the H&F and its predecessors. Some employees and rail fans would also go on to collect items and documents salvaged from the past as well, amassing large assortments of artifacts, tickets, and photographs. Names such as Carol James, Frank Tosh, and Donald Easterday are fondly remembered among the numerous collectors and enthusiasts who never grew out of their interest in the line, even after half a century had passed since the wires came down. The Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Historical Society was formed in 1999 with the goal of preserving and promoting this valuable portion of our region's history, and it's part of the American transportation story. Since the organization's inception, we have taken photograph and artifact exhibits to area events, installed temporary exhibits in partnership with libraries and area museums, provided special multimedia presentations, publish a quarterly members newsletter, and have collected over 1,500 unique H&F related artifacts, documents, photographs, and research resources, not including the many duplicate ticket books and freight tags which have been given to our care. For many years, this collection was gathered and kept secured in much the same way as in many other small to medium-sized history organizations. Items have been made available to researchers by appointment, but they were stored in the same manner and order as received from donors, and lacking in proper cataloging and storage techniques, with little organization with which to find resources. With the help of a museum-trained volunteer, a new accession policy was put in place in 2017, and the arduous process of creating an index of the collection began. Volunteers going one item at a time assigned catalog numbers and locations to objects, all while attempting to identify details from the scattered correspondence and notes kept by members over the years. These partial records included donors, photographers, dates, and origins of objects, among other details. For an artifact identification system, we decided on a trinumeral index number. This is a simple number common in some small museums. Donations for which details can be identified are grouped by a series of three two-digit numbers divided by periods. These numbers represent the year in which the object was donated, followed by the accession number, which is the number assigned to a group of items given by the same donor at the same time, 
and finally a two-digit sequence number, which is assigned to the individual item within that accession, and is used as the reference for that individual object within the group. With many objects donated with no corresponding details, a default year code of 00 has been assigned, but when more information is found about these objects, a new replacement identification number can be assigned at any time. An example of this system in use is shown here. This window latch was taken from H&F car number 172 the official last trolley, before it was scrapped in the 1970s. The first number indicates that this artifact was donated in 2018. The second number, 03, tells us that this was part of the third donation given that year. In this case, we can look at our records and see that everything given in that third donation was transferred to us by the Baltimore Streetcar Museum, who had kept it in their collection since it was removed from the car. The third number, also 03, simply tells us that this was the third item from their donation that we document. With this, we can keep records specific to this individual latch and keep track of it whenever we remove it from the archives for a display. Since this new accession process began, better record keeping has been implemented, allowing donors to give further details regarding the known history of objects being donated. Cataloged items are also now organized and placed in more adequate storage situations as space allows. To protect artifacts from undue decay, the use of gloves during handling has also been made standard to reduce the transfer of harmful oil, fungus, and bacteria. Acid-free materials, including specialized vinyl storage sleeves, archival tissue padding, and museum-rated storage boxes have been used to protect items from damage. Special attention is also now given to UV and heat exposure risks for certain objects. The Society's ability to track what items we had and what was donated by which donor had drastically improved with this project. However, the ability to document more details about items in the collection was limited, and tracking of current locations and condition or providing additional research materials was limited to what we could keep on index cards. In 2020, this changed when the h and RHS was awarded a National Railway Historical Society grant. With this heritage grant, the Society has been able to upgrade to a more reliable archives computer Several backup hard drives allowing for storage of high-resolution scans were also purchased, as was the past-perfect archival software which is commonly used by many museums. Volunteers then modified our existing index spreadsheet to import it directly into PassPerfect, immediately placing our full basic list of items into the software so that we could continue to add information. Between December of 2020 and June of 2021, over 100 volunteer hours have been invested into the process of adding additional information to these listings. With the vast available options within the software, this information includes detailed descriptions, purchase or appraisal value, names of related people and places, size and weight, full known provenance, donor contact information, required captions when exhibited, condition reports, detailed storage locations, and of course the ability to scan or photograph the individual objects into their corresponding listing. These scans are saved automatically in both low and high resolution so that researchers have quick access to browse scans without long load time, and yet quality duplicates can be loaded and printed without the need to handle any original objects, thus prolonging their life. Many additional options are available to grow our records over time, including the ability to create custom data fields. The names of every known company employee, photographer, collector, or any other person who interacted with the h &F system are also being added, and over time, as more is learned about an individual, a full biographical listing can be filled out within the software's people component and automatically linked to every artifact for which we list that individual. Once every item in the collection has had basic information added, it will allow researchers and volunteers to search for items and information much quicker as well as further our understanding of the h and and its history and operations. It will allow us to continually update our descriptions, add notes, and link items in the collection to one another through the related items field to further improve research. The software will also allow us to print identification stickers for each item with unique barcodes to allow for easy tracking of items removed for or returned from exhibits. With the ability to gather these details in a uniform format, much of this information as well as scans and photographs will eventually be made available to the public on our website and other history sites, as well as still being available by appointment. The Society's long-term goal is to continue the growth of our collection and find a permanent home somewhere along the h and right-of-way where a research and exhibit center can be developed and opened for the public by appointment and at certain times of the year.
By developing responsible practices and record keeping in regards to the items in our archive, we hope that we can show prospective donors that we will be a good steward of whatever items they may entrust to us, and that those resources will be available to anyone who is seeking them for the foreseeable future. For more information about the Hagerstown and Frederick Railway Historical Society, including how to donate, support, or volunteer with their archives project, as well as our other activities, please visit hfrhs.org or find us on Facebook.